Good morning, everyone. How are you all doing today? Oh, yeah, that's right. Everybody's home. I can't hear you. Just raise your hand and shake hi. If you're doing well today, everybody tell me how you're doing. Good. I see some hands shaking. The good thing about today is this. If you didn't brush your teeth on time, no one's going to be able to smell your breath. If you forgot to put on deodorant, no one's going to be able to tell. If you woke up late and you just had to roll over, all you had to do was hit click and you're on. And no one knows the difference on how things were started. So that's one of the benefits of being virtual today. But the other part is that we finally get to see each other um, in this virtual space to share once again a lovely conference that we have for you, addressing the challenges of poverty. And really, again, it's one of those times in the year where we see each other throughout the year every once in a while, but we also get to get updates from each other about the work that uh, we're doing in our various states and in our home communities, et cetera. Um, so just be thankful for that. Um, as you see on the PowerPoint there, there's a lot of things going through the slides right now that's going to give you update of information. It's going to let you know what's happening throughout today and tomorrow. So it's, um, we got a lot of different people going on today. And I also have my co-MC, my fellow partner in crime, the one that you can blame if there's any mess ups. Don't blame me, blame him. But no, I want to welcome Jim Ott, who's going to be my co-MC. How are you doing, Jim? Ricky, what's going on? It's so good to see you and see everybody here. Hey, I quick question. Have you seen my shoes? I like, cannot I, see you. You I'm, know what? I, I can't. I, I could not find my shoes this morning. So, like, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I mean, that might be too much information. But, hey, uh, we are so excited. There are people literally from all over the nation, even all over the world. If you have a chance, uh, jump on the chat and just kind of put in where who you are, where you're from. Maybe one hope or expectation for this. I know I woke up this morning, like last, last night I, I started getting ready for this and I'm like, oh, I don't know, is it, what's this gonna be like? And then I just the realization that we are able to connect in a time like this, in this way. I woke up this morning really excited to hear what people are gonna say, knowing that we're gonna hear some amazing stories today, have some great opportunities to be inspired in the good work that we're doing and maybe get some ideas for some things that we can add to uh, the good work they're already doing in our communities. So yeah, take a moment to jump on the chat and just kind of throw in uh, where you're from. It'll be excited to see all the places that are represented. Yeah, and you know, what's great about this is that officially, technically, we are ending the summer uh, with this conference. And so, you know, Tuesday, September 22nd is actually the first day of fall. So we're technically still in summer, I don't know, depending on where you're at, you might not feel like you're in summer, but we are in summer. And so this is a great way to wrap up the summer session and as we transition to fall. And you know, just again, one of the things that we want to highlight as far as what is the purpose of the conference? Well, what we're here to do is stabilize communities, individuals, organizations, and provide strategies to shift policy. And what we want to do is just pretty much eradicate all forms of uh, poverty, that exist in our community so that we can have a, uni a community united in purpose. And so that's the purpose of today. We have, a, a, as again, Jim said, we literally have everyone from all over the nation and internationally. I wanna give a special shout out to all those Canadians up in the Northeast who have chimed in today. Um, if you're from Canada, go ahead and put in the chat, uh, represent your country and where you're from in Canada so we can give you the proper deal and respect as well. And so again, Thank you for showing up today and you'll get information uh, throughout the slides. Make sure that you have your videos on, you have your audio. There's no problems with what you can hear as we transition going back and forth. Um, Jim, any other comments you wanna provide before we get started here pretty soon? Well, just to clarify that what you have, if you're attending this conference, you have a question box and you can type in anything there and that question will be sent in. Um, that's where you can contribute to like where you're from and give us some of that information. So look at the question box and maybe you've got some questions about process, about what's going on. We have people that will be ready to answer those. So um, track with that and you will get your questions answered. Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm personally excited about the fall. Like I think a lot of people are because any change is good right now. Like let's just do something else. Uh, but I'm also aware that we're in the middle of a time where change is something kind of elusive to hold on to. And there's a lot of there's a lot of pressures. Let's face it, we've been through a year 
and uh, the year isn't over. And there doesn't really, like, I don't know about you guys, but I'm hearing people say, oh, wait till 2021. And I was like, no, like, I don't know that just because the calendar turns to a new year, um, that the work's gonna get any easier, that uh, the challenges are gonna be any less. In fact, they may be greater. Uh, but the exciting thing about Bridges work is that, that in this part of the community, in this part of the culture, we have things that work. We have things that make a difference. We have things that bring people together. Uh, if you're not familiar yet with Bridges Across Every Divide, which Phil and Gene Krebs wrote, um, that really emphasizes that when it comes to addressing poverty, we can have conversations across political lines that are not being held anyplace else in our culture right now. And we have good ideas that work. And everybody you will hear from today, from my own life, from the people that you see that are going to be presenting, they will tell you that this is work that bridges gaps of misunderstanding, of ideology, because everybody is motivated to make their communities a better place. And so we have something that offers hope. And I think maybe that's why I woke up so excited today, because I'm entering into a world of hope for the next couple of days during a time when, ah, it's not that hopeful. Like there's a lot of a lot of discouragement. And, you know, I mean, I appreciate, I can see your faces. I go out, hey, how many of you guys know this, that you go out in public now and actually sometimes a mask is convenient because people you don't want to recognize don't recognize you. <laughs> like this has been actually a good thing. I ran into someone at the doctor's office. I was like, oh wait, she didn't know who I am. Now I'm just gonna turn around and walk the other way. So, you know, it's not all bad, but, the reality is I miss seeing people's faces. I miss talking face to face with people and, and meeting people that way. We you have wanna, hope. You want to know one fun fact about the mask, Jim, that I learned early when, when we started having to do the mask mandate? I realized I needed to brush my teeth a little bit more often. That first time mm -hmm. wearing that mask and that kick back back into my nose, I realized this is a really good prevent, uh, commercial provi you know, providing for tenants around the world. It lets you know you need to brush twice a day, literally twice a day, maybe three times, especially after you have lunch. You got to put the mask back on and now you're just getting the onions right back in your breath. But anyway, no, I digress. <laughs> Sorry about that. But <laughs> no, so we got a wonderful thing. We got some great headliners. And of course, we got the superstars um, here live today and on chat with us. We got Phil Duvall. We have Terry Smith. I see Ruben Perez. I see Angel Tucker. I see Mike Thames. We have a lot of great people. And then, of course, we have the one and only. We have Ruby uh, Payne on the line as well, who's here to uh, show her face every once in a while as well. And so we got the wonderful people that you read about, that you read the works, that you saw their studies, the ones that have set this foundation for this wonderful conference and for these decades now of providing hope and, and unity for the communities around us as well. Um, some things to be looking forward to in advance is number one, later on tonight, there's going to be a listening session to tell your story. For those who were present last year, that first night, we always do kind of like what uh, resonates with you? What story do you have on how Bridges Out of Poverty has really been instrumental in your life? Again, that's going to be today from uh, 6 to 7.30 Central Time, 6 to 30, uh, 7.30 Central Time, and you can... Um, get that registration link through uh, the uh, the website as well. Also, a reminder to all the attendees today, you must register for your session to be accessible to that session. All right, so do not think you're gonna be able to see the session if you have not registered. And so we put in the uh, chat earlier today, the uh, registration link for the breakout sessions. So make sure you register for your sessions as well. And there's handouts for the breakout sessions. There's no handouts for the um, the opening sessions or the closing sessions, only the actual breakout sessions themselves. Um, hey, Jim, I heard we got door prizes today. What's All that right, about? Well, we got to do something fun. So as you're watching your uh, your sessions later and, and keeping track of the PowerPoints, there is buried a little picture of Phil. I think he's on a horse. And there's a little picture of Ruby who is not on a horse. And if you are the first person to see that and then type it in and say, I saw it, and here's the slide it was on and who was presenting, 
you will win a door prize. And if it, if it, now I don't exactly know what the door prizes are this year. I think it's, is it a car? A new car? No, it's not a car. Um, but it's something. And coupons. Coupons for a car. Anyway, if you are the first one to identify those, so keep your eyes peeled. It's a little like, it's kind of a Where's Waldo, um, sort of a I spy deal. But if you type that in or the first one, Lynn Jackson will get in touch with you and you will have some nice door prizes available. So it's just a little game. It's a $20 gift certificate to the AHA store. You'll be able to buy some nice materials. And man, are there a lot of good materials and they just keep getting better. Like the stuff that's coming out, the application, it just keeps getting better. So that's a valuable $20 that you really want to try to watch for. Keep your eyes out peeled for that. Right, so there we have on the screen there for the attendees right now, the icons and what they, uh, what Ruby and Phil looks like. I thought when I saw Phil's uh, icon, I thought it was an episode from City Slickers, the movie back in the day. I thought he was a stand-in for that right there. And then for those, if you know Ruby and you see Ruby's icon, yeah. if you can tell her what kind of shoes she got on, because she's always going to tell you about the real real and what her shoe game is like, then you get an extra bonus, I think, right there. So those are the two icons just so you can get familiar. So first and foremost, pay attention to the material that's being presented and then look for the icon. Don't be so stuck. I know there's some competitive people who all they heard was I can win something and then they forget all about the presentation and they just try to find the icons. So make sure you're paying attention to the information that's provided in addition to trying to find the icons going on there as well. So a special thanks again to um, all of our presenters, our volunteers who have given their time. Special thanks for you, whatever time zone you're in, um, making that sacrifice, waking up. Um, think of it like this, you get a reward, especially like if you're, if you're like myself today who has kids, I get uh, a couple hours for today to kind of barricade myself from the virtual learning, the virtual teacher. You know, I'm a principal at, uh, at, at an elementary school, I'm a dean at a middle school, and then I'm an administrator at a college. And so I get to, you know, excuse myself for a few hours today and, and you know, um, thank you to the spouses who are taking care of those kids while we are coming here to be edified with uh, learning and enrichment as well. Um, any closing remarks, Jim, as we get close to time to kick off? Oh, I kicked Jim off. That's what happens. Okay. So anyway, I want to again show you, I think we saw the map earlier. I want to kind of show everybody on the map exactly where everybody's coming from. If you see on the map right now, when we say we're literally all across the nation today, we mean literally all across the nation. It was like there's a big abundance from um, Georgia. I can't even see Georgia. And then of course, of course, there's that state. If you all remember last year, those folks I tell you to be mindful of, the OH, I.O. I hear them saying it from a, virtually. I hear people, I, my neighbor just stepped out saying I.O. Those folks over there, those people in Ohio, they come strong every year. So wonderful to hear all the great people from Ohio. And then again, like we said, we see some people from uh, Canada. It looks like Toronto. I'm not good with my geography. I just know we're in the North America. That's all I see right now. But I think it's Toronto. So uh, if you're from Canada and Toronto area, Toronto metropolitan area, we want to say thank you for showing up again. And just again, a big thanks for all those showing. Now, as you're doing this, remember, we're here to edify each other. Make sure you ask questions. Make sure you're taking something back for those who aren't able to um, experience this enrichment and this PowerPoint and these presentations today. But most of all, make sure that you take time to reflect on how thankful we are that we get to share these experiences again, especially throughout the year that we've had today, that we've had a time to come together, that we have not been stopped, and we won't let things stop us to uh, continue to come together in unity to find ways to eradicate poverty across our nation and across our community. So just be thankful for that. Take time to reflect on these things. Remember that what we're here for is not just ourselves, for the, but for the communities that we represent as well and for those families that we work with day in and day out, for those uh, presentations that we make uh, year in and year out uh, so that we can provide a better uh, sense of understanding and purpose to our clients and to our community so they feel valued, especially in times that we're going through currently. So again, I thank you all for coming to the conference today. I thank you all for sacrificing your time. And again, I wanna say we have some wonderful presenters 
And I know we got about one minute before we wrap up. And so I want to go right into and start introducing our very first one, because as soon as I start for introducing them, we'll be ready to kick off. So our very first presenter for our breakout today is going to be Jeff Adams. And Jeff Adams is the former superintendent from Farmersville Independent School District out of Dallas, Texas, big up to Texas. And um, what he is doing is he is going to be talking about present and post-pandemic in the world of K-12 education. Present and post-pandemic in the world of K-12 education. All right. And so with that, it looks like we are ready to let Jeff begin. Go ahead, Jeff. Okay, and can you hear me okay? Just mute. I can hear you oh, perfectly fine. Everybody can hear me, so ready to go? Yeah. Yes, yes, sir. Thank you for being with me this morning. We're going to talk a little bit about pandemic in schools. And I want you to remember, especially if we're talking about public schools, they're both nonprofit and bridges out of poverty. And so we're going to talk a little bit about this today, how both students and staff have been affected and our communities as well. So I thank you for being with me as we move forward. Just a second about myself. I retired after 22 and a half years as superintendent. Through that time, I have used Framework for Understanding Poverty for over 20 years, been very successful, and I give a lot of credit to the success in our district too, Ms. Ruby, for helping us understand and have empathy and understand where we go with those students. I work part-time now as a liaison for Ms. Ruby and AHA, and I enjoy it, but enough about me, let's jump into the school districts. Big pandemic concerns for K-12 schools. Student safety has always been first and foremost. Students can't learn unless they feel safe, and we've known that. Academic success. We're there to educate the students so they can compete in a global economy. And we're not there just to be a diploma mill. We want our students to be able to go out and compete worldwide for jobs. Standardized testing. That's a concern if you have standardized testing because you're held accountable. And if you're not paying attention to standardized testing, I promise you, you will be once the scores come in, if you're held accountable for those. So that's always a concern of the staff. Funding shortages. I've been in education for over 35 years and always there has been a concern of where's the money coming from? How much money is there? Where's it gonna come from in the future? So that's something that's always been there and it will continue to be there, and especially in these times that we're facing today. Day-to-day -day operations, that's where you just show up every day and you hope everything goes smooth, that you have planned, everything runs like clockwork, and it doesn't always for the teacher, the principal, or the superintendent, but that's what you hope, so you have to plan and be concerned for that. Moving forward, let's talk about the Roaring Twenties some. In the 1900s, they had the flappers and they had about eight good years through the economy before the Great Depression hit. Well, moving forward 100 years later, we had about two good months. We made it to February before the tough times hit with COVID-19, and it's shaking both our health and our economy. So we're going to talk a little bit about that in schools today and how it's affected us. Pandemic concerns for K-12 schools after the pandemic is hit. If you look at those, they look very much like the same list that you saw a few minutes ago. That's because they are the same, but now there's adding elements to it that we have to look at and work through. So we're gonna talk about those for a few minutes today because I think sometimes the general public doesn't understand what all students and staff are going through at this time. Personal learning safety concerns, social distancing, that's a big one. We've never had to worry about that before in school, but now we have to spread students out in the classroom, in the hallways, in the cafeteria, and on the school buses. And just stop and think for a minute how difficult it is to social distance with a bunch of eight, nine-year-olds that all want to get together and hug and haven't seen each other in a while. But that's just one of the things that's been added to the job of the staff to deal with every day. Mask. We've had masks before in my day. You might have wore a mask, much like you see on the screen. We may have went to school as Batman or the Lone Ranger or something, but that has changed drastically. And, and when we talk about masks, I have talked to superintendents from California to New Jersey, Arkansas, Texas, 
And there's many different ways that this is being administered in districts. And even within the state, it's not the same. In some districts, everyone has to wear a mask and the teachers have to wear a shield. In other districts, 10 and below don't wear a mask, the older students do. So it's different wherever you go. But in my day, this may be what you look like if you wore a mask to school, if you were brave enough one day to do so. Today, this is what a student looks like masking up for school. Uh, and this young man is masking up, getting ready for a day of education. And if you look close in his eyes and you think he may look familiar, well, that look in his eyes, you might see my eyes in an earlier slide. That's my grandson getting ready for a day in the second grade. And sanitizing station. While we've always probably had it sitting on the teacher's desk, now many or most schools have actual stations set up throughout the school where students go by and get a squirt as they need. And you think, well, that's not such a big deal until you're the one that has to make sure that it, the bottle is full, the students are using it properly, they're not wasting it. Now, I've even heard from some districts, some of the sanitizer they've got has been in such a liquid form, they've had to add gel to it just to make it so they could use it. And so you think about the added time and duties of the staff on something just as simple as small as this that we've never had to do before. Monitoring the students. We've always had to monitor students. We've monitored them in the hallways, in the cafeteria, on the bus stops. There's always been staff to follow and monitor students. But think about the added pressure now of making sure they keep social distance, they wear masks when required, and follow just the general protocol that's been put forth by the school district. Again, staff didn't have to worry about that a year ago this time, but it's very much a concern in this day and age. And if they don't adhere to it, they're going to end up on the evening news somewhere with somebody's cell phone taking a picture and sh shooting it out. It'll be across the world in a few moments. Another change in our time. Standardized testing is still a concern. But now it's a concern because we're going to be testing students who missed, you know, or they've been out of school for over 100 days now and just coming back. And we've always known about the summer slide. And I mean, this Ruby talks about it in some of her programs. Sometimes the students don't retain or the retention level is not what we wish when they come back from one year to the next. But now we have to not only worry about that, we have to worry about learning gaps. Did they ever learn the information or was it in the last eight or nine weeks that they missed? You know, in the past, I would talk with staff members and they would say, oh my, the students didn't quite retain what we'd hoped they would through the summer. Well, this year, I talked to a couple of teachers and it's, oh my gosh, they've fallen off the COVID cliff. They don't know where to start with them because now they've moved to grade level and they're far behind where they're normally at. So what did they lose? What did they never get? Those are all things that have to be considered as we move forward with the students so that they don't get left behind. Staff, we have to be concerned about their health. I'm gonna let you in on a little secret. It's hard to have school without teachers and subs are gonna be hard to come by this year. We're already hearing that, but we need teachers to be healthy and in their classroom. They also have to have the ability to adapt and willingness to do so because change is on the doorstep every day this year. They have to be prepared to do so. Also, emotional well-being of the staff is big. Not just their health, but their emotional well-being is gonna come into play. I visited with the teacher just a couple of days ago and she feels like now she's a jack of all trades and master of none because she's doing face-to-face -face learning, virtual learning, has students at all different levels Students missed some gaps from last year, trying to tie into the start of this year, and she just feels overwhelmed in the second week of school. So we've really got to be concerned and watch our staff, both emotionally as well as health, moving forward. Funding, we're talking, and I know we're going through this quick, but we're on a limited amount of time as we talk about funding. COVID expenses, March to August. Did you overexpend your budget last year? I talked to one district who had an extra $120,000 in food services they went over just feeding all the children that were through the time they were out of school. Cuts looming because of downturn in the economy. Usually when the economy drops, so do school districts. 
future funding roles for student enrollments. You know, most school districts are paid in some form by a number of students that show up. And so if they're not there, you're probably going to lose some money, whether they're homeschooled, doing something different, or just moving to a different place. Many districts are going to face challenges with that. And then the cost of the new normal, smaller classes, social distancing, transportation. Anytime you have less people on the bus and you have to run two routes, it costs more money. Smaller classes means more money. And then, for example, my wife is a CFO in a mid-sized district in the state of Texas. They were looking at purchasing wipes to wipe the students down before and after each class. And this was going to add over a half million dollars to their budget in one school year. Again, that's something that we've not seen before. And now you think about what all could you buy with that, but it may be turned into we have to buy that. So there are new challenges we're facing in every day in all areas of the school district. And the day-to-day -day challenges for the staff again face-to-face -face learning. You know, are they going back with the students in the classroom? Are they doing full-time virtual? Are they doing a hybrid? And can they swift back, swiftly go back and forth and shift as needed? Because some are starting face-to-face -face, then have to go back to virtual. Some have started virtual, just now going to face-to-face, -to -face, and some are a hybrid in between. So those are all challenges being faced by staff who before always had to just show up, be prepared to teach their class, in the room that day. It's quite a change for the staff. And as we talk about that, you know, the challenges for the staff, being prepared, you know, can they change? Can they move back and forth from these types of delivery as they need to? Challenges for the students, do they have the technology? Is it available? Do they have hotspots? Do they have internet at home? If they need to for virtual learning, we have seen that that's been a problem so far with the COVID. Gaps from the slide. You know, do they have got gaps of retention or did they never get the information? But we know we're going to have to bring the students up to where they need to be to continue to move forward. And then the students' well-being, both health and emotional. We know it's taking a toll on the students because we hear every day it's taking a toll on adults. You hear it on the news. You see it with people. So you know they may have left well-adjusted they may not come back well adjusted to all that they've been through. So I think we've got to keep that in mind and it's a daunting task for staff, but we have to think about that for our students. Let's talk a minute about post pandemic. What is it going to look like? Well, your guess is probably as good as mine, but we'll talk about a few things that we do know for sure. Students will have gaps to recover from. We've already discussed that. We won't spend a lot of time about that. The next one, we're going to spend just a minute on funding will be an issue. When the economy hurts, so do schools. Remember I mentioned earlier, especially if you're a public school, you're a nonprofit. And you're going to hurt as well as we've already seen our food banks that are hurting, churches that have stepped up. We've had all these people that have helped get through this. But we're at the point now where cupboards are starting to get bare. And it's hard to replenish when the economy is not strong because people just don't have extra money to give. I have a daughter-in-law that works in a nonprofit agency. When I ask her, well, how are things going? She tells me, well, all of our partners say we want to do something, but we can't do what we've done in the past. So those are all areas that you know, are going to be difficult as we try to work through for our students. And the new normal may not be so normal. For example, you know, we may be wearing masks for a long time to come. And that's something that's Another example of that, what, think back to after 9-11 with the airports. We've never gone back to the way we were with those. You can't just walk up to the gate with your family now. We may not go back from some of these things that we're facing today. But one thing we know for sure, if you don't take anything else away from this presentation, there will be more poverty, both financially and emotionally. We're going to have to deal with the students. So we've got to be prepared to do so as a staff. And school people always rise to the challenge. So I don't doubt they will, but we're going to have to all work together, you know, have kindness, and continue to work to try to help everybody move forward through this pandemic. A couple of quick things as I finish up that I want to say a couple of Carl Rogers quotes. The only person who is educated is the one who has learned how to learn and change, but I think is very typical in this day and age. And then the last one I have, 
when I look at the world, I'm pessimistic. But when I look at people, I'm optimistic. And when you look at this little cutie on the side of the grass, how can you not be optimistic? And if you look in her eyes, you might say, I've seen that before. Well, you saw her cousin earlier and her grandfather earlier. That is my granddaughter, who I look forward to the world being a great place for her. And I've got to finish quickly, so I'm moving along. If I can be of any help to you in any way, please contact me, email me, call me, text me, send a smoke signal, whatever you can do. I appreciate your kind attention. And I think I'm out of time, so I'm going to go back to Jim and Ricky. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, what a great way to start off our first session and really understanding the details and not missing out on the people. What I, what I really picked up on that is making sure we're not allowing silent casualties, making sure we recognize our students are important, our teachers are important, understanding that the little details of budgeting, substitute teaching, all these things are something that we're going to start thinking about forward looking and in preparation that some of these new normals might uh, exist after COVID and how are we going to manage and be mindful of those things as well. So thank you so much, Jeff, and beautiful grandkids as well. Nice way to show the family and corporation there as well. And um, just in case, uh, congratulations to our first door prize winner, uh, Lauren Valderez, who spotted. Um, I think it was Ruth. Yes, yeah, Spider Ruth, uh, Ruby, I mean, uh, Ruby in the presentation. So congratulations to you, Lauren, as well. And just a thank you again for a quick shout out. We have now internationally, we have some people from Australia logging on. So thank you for those from Australia logging on as well. With further ado, I want to introduce Adrian Elder. Adrian is going to be talking about addressing adverse childhood experiences and also commonly known as ACEs and building resilience with getting ahead. And she's going to be doing a Petra Kucha style presentation. So sit back and enjoy how Petra Kucha styles are done. Adrian, it's off to you. Great, thank you. Um, again, Adrian Elder here, and I'll be uh, talking with you today about the um, importance of coalitions using peer support groups and how uh, getting ahead curriculum with the new ACEs supplement can increase community resilience. Uh, we know that there are a lot of um, efforts across the country um, trying to make a trauma-informed nation, and we can build on that momentum. Uh, today's presentation is ded dedicated to each of us who have experienced some level of trauma or adversity, and especially to my friend Kendra, who um, is a survivor of domestic violence, uh, she is in recovery from substance use, and with positive support systems, she is now an amazing role model to not only her children, but is inspiring community members to take action. In the midst of the pandemic, which is causing uh, chaos and confusion and highlighting inequities and racial injustice, it is more important than ever to create these clear and inclusive pathways on how we can build the community resilience. We hope that this new Getting Ahead ACEs supplement can be a tool that helps with that effort. Um, it was created by Phil Duvall and myself to further incorporate trauma science into Bridges communities, Getting Ahead, and with those local and global coalitions that are addressing adverse childhood experiences and adverse community experiences. Um, specifically, we want to connect the dots on how uh, getting ahead um, with the new Getting Ahead ACEs supplement can really be a tool for coalitions to engage marginalized voices that really provide the transformational fuel for our communities to heal. So the Getting Ahead with ACEs, um, it does provide that safety. It, it, it's aligned with the CDC guiding principles. Uh, we provide safe and healing spaces. Uh, we build trustworthiness through transparency. We uh, build authentic relationships through peer support groups. We work with community partners that increase collaboration. We empower a voice and choice with marginalized individuals. 
and we um, all in the context of uh, respecting cultural, historical, and individual and gender issues. So we know that poverty is one of the top 10 uh, most uh, studied adverse community environments. And this uh, pair of ACEs tree is a great visual aid that paints a holistic picture on how these adversities are interconnected and really creates a vicious cycle. So as a society, we are often overwhelmed and distracted and divided with limited resources. We are trying to tackle um, each of these adversities separately. However, with increased understanding of the root causes, we can focus our efforts on these unifying concepts and increase collaborative solutions. So these root causes are like toxic seeds that negatively affect every aspect of our society. They include the prolonged activation of stress response systems in our body, in the absence of protective relationships and supportive environments, and the lack of core life skills. The silver lining is that the latest trauma science from Harvard and beyond shows that common roots equal common solutions. Resources can be aligned on providing three key supports that create that nutrient rich soil and thriving families. These root solutions create a positive ripple effect throughout our society. We must be intentional about how we reduce sources of stress, how we support responsive relationships and environments, and how we strengthen those core life skills. Science shows that these three principles are highly interconnected and they increase healthy development and educational achievement in children and responsive caregiving and economic stability in adults. So how do community coalitions incorporate these three principles? Well, getting ahead with the ACES supplement can provide um, those weekly meals, childcare and stipend and transportation to reduce the sources of stress. Um, over 18 weeks, uh, create authentic relationships that last beyond graduation, and strengthening core life skills with a trauma-informed curriculum that builds executive functioning skills over 11 different domains. By creating this shared language and promoting the three principles, we can move the needle faster. Policymakers can work with institutions to embed these three principles to improve child and family outcomes, and eventually to improve our communities. So combining these complementing concepts, this clear and inclusive pathway can guide communities on the continuum of being trauma-informed. Level one is trauma-aware, level two is trauma-sensitive, level three is trauma-responsive, and level four is trauma-informed, also hope or healing-centered. So an example for level one is that communities can use documentaries or films like the resilience film to build that common language, to increase understanding um, of, of trauma and what that is and to begin that, that inclusive journey and how we all must work together to make this a reality. Level two is that community coalitions can create trauma sensitive uh, cross sector trainings with staff. Um, AHA and all of the Bridges uh, work um, complements what the National Child Traumatic Stress Network is doing, ACEs Connection, and the National Trauma Campaign, which can provide uh, policy and model legislation, again, to move the needle faster. Level three is trauma responsive. As community organizations work better together, they can create trauma responsive family resource centers also known as one-stop shops that really integrate those services based on local needs and, and cultural interests. The national family support work can help guide those, those community partnership agreements. And finally, level four, coalitions can become trauma-informed by implementing peer, su peer support groups, which meaningfully engage marginalized voices to create an equitable pipeline who provide transformational fuel to heal our communities. Uh, we invite you to learn more. Uh, we are having upcoming trainings and we really uh, believe we are at a tipping point 
where bridges and ACEs coalitions can move the needle faster together. Thank you. Oh, okay, that's like not even fair. That's Pecha Kucha, 20 slides in 20 seconds each. And I want to stop and spend the rest of the morning talking about that. It's personal. I'm a school psychologist. This is like my life. And to see two passions of my life, broken kids and bridges being brought together and getting ahead is phenomenal. And Adrian, that is amazing stuff. Um, following with Jeff's, you know, talking about what's going on in schools and then having this kind of information is phenomenal. Check into this. You need to learn more about it. But we don't have time to talk about it right now because we got to move on. Our next presenter is Angel Tucker. Um, if there was ever a time when Angel's story was needed in our culture, it's now. Um, Angel is a police officer in Oregon, Ohio, who has been implementing tactical communication both nationally as a consultant, as well as locally in his own work. And his story is incredible. Um, Angel, we love you, man. Let's hear what you got to say today. Angel, how about, is you, are you muted? Angel, you muted? Oh, I think I'm unmuted now. Okay, now I'm gonna go away. All right, thank you. Um, I'm definitely in some good company, so I appreciate uh, being considered. Uh, my name is Angel Tucker. I'm a police officer in Lucas County, Ohio. And I just kind of wanted to give you a quick background. I've been a police officer for almost 10 years now, and I've served on various uh, elements of our police division. Uh, from being a current crisis negotiator, which used to be known as a hostage negotiator, uh, from the SWAT team to the bike patrol, uh, honor guard unit, and so on and so forth. As you see, I uh, like to do a lot. So I'm really excited about this training. This is one of the more exciting trainings that I've ever had the opportunity to be a part of, and I hope you feel the same. Uh, before we do, I wanna make sure we acknowledge Dr. Ruby Payne and Jody Farr, without whom uh, we would not have tactical communication to bring to you today. With that being said, I always like to start with what tactical communication is not. Tactical communication is not racial or cultural diversity training. This is not kumbaya. I promise I'm not gonna ask you to sit around any campfires and sing songs and hug it out. This is not hug a thug. And this is not an excuse for bad or bad behavior or criminal activity. What tactical communication is, is an opportunity. It's an opportunity to strengthen the relationship in the communities that we serve. It's also an opportunity to increase not only the safety of our first responders, but the safety of our community members. We can lower community complaints and also recognize biases that we may have. We can improve our de-escalation tactics. And last but not least, we can protect and preserve lives. I met plenty of first responders doing what I do from the length of time that I've been doing it. And I'm gonna say it's a very rare occasion if I meet someone who did not get into this field to protect and preserve life. I don't think any of us do it for the money or the prestige. But with that being said, I want to kind of give you a background on how I was introduced to tactical communication. So my wife, Kathy, she went to a Bridges Out of Poverty training. And if any of you have taken it, feel free to give me a wave or a thumbs up in the comments section. Uh, she went to a Bridges Out of Poverty training um, who was taught by um, D. Washington at the time. And my wife came home from an all day training and decided that she wanted to tell me about the entire training over a 45 minute dinner and keep in mind my wife is from upper middle class i am myself from poverty so the minute she told me she went to a training called bridges out of poverty i kind of tuned out because i said there's nothing you're going to be able to teach me or tell me about poverty so i kind of zoned out most of the dinner um listening enough just to say okay yeah i hear you i agree then she went a second time and she came home with that same level of enthusiasm, which I was surprised. And she proceeded to do the exact same thing again and try to tell me about it over a 45 minute dinner. And then she ended it with, yeah, I'm gonna go a third time and you're going with me. 
Now, keep in mind, I've been a police officer for a while and, you know, SWAT, A-type personality. And when she just told me I was going with her, I looked her dead in her eyes and I said, okay, yes, dear, whatever you say. Uh, I went to the training and I have to, I have to admit, I was impressed from the very beginning. I didn't know what to expect, but even the opener kind of made me think, okay, I really need to pay attention to this. So there was a gentleman um, by the name of Stephen McDonald. He was the facilitator that day. And it was it was an odd group, so um, odd number that is. So I ended up being paired with Stephen. And as we talked, and we talked about my background and, and some of the things that I had been through and some of the directions I would like to see not only uh, law enforcement, but first responders go, he asked me, hey, would you be willing to facilitate this to actually become a presenter? And so, of course, I looked across the room at my wife and she said, yes. So I say yes. And I asked him, I said, but what's your target audience? And he said, first responders. <laughs> and I kind of laughed at him. I said, listen, you'll never get first responders to willingly take a class or a workshop called Bridges Out of Poverty. It's just not going to happen. So he advised me, no, we have one and it's called tactical communication which is birthed off of Bridges Out of Poverty. So I said, okay, now you can count me in because as you know, if you paint it black or call it tactical, we're all in. I said, what do we need to do? I'm all in, let's get started. He says, we gotta get Jody Farr here. I said, okay, how do we do that? He says, money. So we went on a two week, actually it was two month campaign uh, to raise the funds to get Jody to Lucas County to present this this uh, workshop and this facility and facilitate it for a full day. Well, we ran into some roadblocks and barriers, but luckily the Lucas County Health Department they kicked in the funds and we were able to bring Jody. So I get the word. All right, funds are secured. Jody's coming. Now what do we need to do next? He says, Well, now I need you to get all the shot callers in one room. And he was referring to staffs from the mayor's office, uh, police chiefs, fire chiefs, brass, county commissioners, um, city administrators, anybody that has the power or the authority to possibly move the needle forward in this change that Bridges Out of Poverty is bringing to our community. So I said, okay, and I did my part and he did his part and everything worked out and we were able to get Jody Farr to Lucas County. So on May 15, 2018, tactical communication was introduced to Lucas County. And I have to admit, uh, Jody came in and, and she captivated the audience. Uh, right from the very beginning, people were very interested in what we had to say. And she did it by breaking down mental models, hidden rules, and language registers for all three socioeconomic classes, poverty, middle class, and wealth. And she also showed us how each socioeconomic background deals with emergency situations differently, which is a key point when it comes to the work that we do as first responders. Now, these are two of the chiefs that were there. The smaller picture is Chief Craw, he's from Toledo. He was so impressed, he said he wanted his next academy class to be trained in tactical communication. He just couldn't believe how true everything that was being said was and how it related to what he saw out in the field. Now, the bigger picture is Chief Navarre, who was my current chief, who used to be the chief of police for Toledo. He himself, he also said, he's very impressed with tactical and he would like to see all of his officers trained. Well, luckily he has me and we are getting all of our officers trained in tactical. Now everybody walked away from this training feeling really good and informed, but what they could not know is that this will be put to the test six weeks later by way of an officer involved shooting. And here's a video that's going to give you an idea of how that went down. And someone, please let me know if the audio is not playing. Angel, we're not hearing the video. Okay, how do 
I apologize. So is there something to turn on to hear the video? Is there a link we can use? Angel, I think you'll just need to recap it and we can put it into your final uh, recorded presentation. Okay, so I will, as it's playing, I will let you know what's going on. So there was a young gentleman by the name of Lamar Richardson. And Mr. Richardson had been committing several crimes within the Lucas County area. So after he was located, um, there were some SWAT officers that took chase and he was subsequently shot and killed. And this was in the north side of Toledo. Now, Chief Crawl had sent all of uh, Toledo to the north side because tensions were rising. And during these tensions, he made a few key points. Now I'm gonna show, I'm gonna be quiet for a minute, just let you kind of see the anger within the crowd. Now, if you'll see, if you'll notice, there are a lot of officers that are not in riot gear. And as you see, the crowd looked pretty tense. They were in the face of the officers and officers just basically stood their ground. If you can look, you can see even that gentleman that they just showed in the red hat, he actually was pouring beverages out on officers. There were other officers that as you can see there were consoling people a, a totally different approach as to what you would normally see in a situation like this. So normally when things like this happen, I'll give my wife a call, especially if I know it's gonna make the news. I was working this day and I work in a neighboring city. So we rendered mutual aid. So while all of Toledo were dealing with this in North Toledo, we were diverted to go work on East Toledo. So I always like to call my wife to let her know what's going on so she does the work. I've made that mistake not calling her one time and then I also made the mistake of calling her uh, when I was on the SWAT team and saying, hey babe, someone's shooting at us. It's gonna be on the news, I'll give you a call back. And she didn't hear from me for like three hours. So I've learned to refine how I do this. So now I'll put my phone on speaker, put it in the visor and I'll just kind of talk her through it for a couple of minutes so that she doesn't worry any more than I know she's going to. Well, while we were talking, I was saying little things like, oh, I hope he doesn't put them in riot gear, which he did not, as you see. I hope he doesn't break out the dogs. Because you know, if you show up like you're ready to fight with canines and, and riot gear in an under-resourced community, they're gonna say, you wanna fight? We're gonna fight. I was praying that he didn't put the SWAT team visible. I also was hoping he would bring in a mother or grandmother or sister seeing how our under-resourced communities are more matriarchal. Well, not only did he do all of those things, but he went a step further and he released that dash cam footage immediately. And that was a key point in how he handled that situation. Now, why is that important? Anyone who's taken bridges out of poverty, um, they will know about the part that um, under-resourced communities are more uh, matriarchal, they will understand that key point, and you will too when you come to our next uh, seminar. Now, the very next day, there was already a community picnic um, slash party that had been planned and permitted in that exact same community. And of course, seeing how the whole community was there, the news was there. And the news really wanted to come out and they wanted the community to express how disappointed they were in law enforcement. They wanted to, the community to express their anger and how the situation was handled. And of course, the community made a statement. Now, if you wanna know how that statement went and what was said and done, then you can join us on September 22nd at 9 a.m. Central Time Zone, myself and Gary Ruddick. Uh, for tactical communication and building effective bridges. I thank you for your time. Angel, uh, actually, actually, you're a minute under. You have one more minute. You got anything you want to, else you want to say? Because I could listen to this all day, and I never get tired of this story. 
because of the of the pain that is in so many communities right now. Um, what I will add to this is tactical communication. It's it's like anything else. So when I became a crisis negotiator, I spent a week at the FBI's training academy in Cleveland, Ohio. And one thing that they drilled into our heads is this is a diminishing skill. This is not something that, oh, I took a, a webinar or I took it live or I took it in person or I read the book and now I got it. Just like everything that we do here in the Bridges community, this is an ongoing effort. This is something that it will need continuous work and it will we will have to continue to nurture it and grow it in order for this to really be effective. Yeah. Quality stuff. Well, if you look in the chat, you'll see that you can uh, register for, for both an online tactical communication on September 29th. And then, depending on where you're at in your Bridges work, you have the opportunity to be certified as a tactical communications trainer. Um, I encourage you to share this information with your community to get uh, that video alone is powerful and will speak to community leaders and law enforcement. And uh, we have Angel as a resource and we are blessed to have you, brother. Thank you so much. And we appreciate all your work today. Thank you for having me. All right, we're going to move on. And uh, our next presenter is one of the authors of Bridges Out of Poverty and best described as a real hoot. This is Terry Ducey Smith. She has That's always sweet. got some fun stuff to share, and she has been devoting her particular sector work, as you probably know, to Bridges to Health and Healthcare. Um, one of the things that it, we, we are definitely seeing, obviously, is stress on the healthcare system. And when there is stress, whole institutions go into their own version of poverty. Bridges to Health and Healthcare can definitely be uh, helpful in that. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Terry and let's hear what she's got to share with us today. Thanks, Jim. I have many good years of working with Jim, it's awesome. So I'm Terry, as Jim said, co-author of Bridges Out of Poverty and Bridges to Health and Healthcare. And I know that some of you are new uh, to our work and some of you have been here probably almost as long as I have. And I just know each of you holds an important role in our Bridges and Getting Ahead work and I'm very pleased to be with you today. Since our subject is health, I just like you to think back on the last six months. It's tough to think through everything the health system has been through. If we were in person, we would uh, I would ask you to, to applaud our healthcare providers and the public health officials who have been working uh, so hard through this pandemic. And those in behavioral health also I'd like to recognize because there's been such an insurgence of needs uh, for healthcare provider, uh, for providers of, of behavioral health as well. Um, so along with the pandemic, the issue of layered and ongoing inequities has arisen in 2020. And I would like to address how social inequities impact our health. Um, and we're going to look at the health of individuals, but I, I think we're also looking at the health of communities. And I just want to give a nod to Adrian and the ACEs and getting head work and to Phil, because if you have uh, three, several ACEs uh, and negative experiences when you are young, what can happen is that the stress of that, especially from birth to six, can have such an impact on your health that you would, um, you would perhaps be more vulnerable to early onset of diseases such as diabetes, heart disease, and especially autoimmune disorders in your 30s. So sometimes you'll see people who are really struggling with their health in their 30s and uh, need some of those resources and to build resiliency. Um, so if you look at this, health inequity is what we're gonna be talking about. It refers, this is a definition, uh, refers to the uneven distribution of social and economic resources that impact an individual's health. Inequities often stem from structural racism or the historical disenfranchisement and discrimination of particular marginalized groups, including racial and ethnic minorities and members of the LGBTQ population. So there is a lot of research also that shows that when you're in poverty and you've got long-term poverty and deep poverty, you're gonna have a much higher risk of poor health. 
And this population is a primary concern, of course, of bridges to health and healthcare. So for example, my husband had leukemia and we went to MD Anderson for six months or so. And every Monday, Wednesday and Friday, uh, we would be uh, in a waiting room, with the same people, like 150 people, the same people, right? And um, those people uh, got to know them. And there were a couple people there who were um, from probably under-resourced uh, communities and, and have been probably generational poverty. So when we were talking, I asked them what kind of leukemia their uh, husbands had, and neither one of them could tell me. And this was like six months after the diagnosis. And so I asked them, well, are they still trying to figure it out? And they said, no, the, the doctor knows. It's just that I don't know. And, and I began to think about that because, you know, we were so intentional about making lists of questions to ask the doctor and pri prioritizing those questions just in case the, we didn't get to all of them. And that that whole piece about, you know, I, I just was afraid, I think. I, I'm just afraid to ask the doctor a question because that doctor's so smart and I'm not sure I'm gonna understand the, the answer and then I'll have to ask another question. I'm gonna look stupid. And I began to realize that how we approach health based on our resources can make a huge difference on how we negotiate through that. Now, most healthcare providers uh, are frustrated with underinsured and under-resourced patients because they're often no-shows, right? And we have this in all the sectors and they're maybe hours late to appointments. So the first thing people tell me is that health disparities are caused by lack of transportation or no insurance, no access to healthcare. So I wanted to show you this study of lower and higher income communities in Ger Germany. And it shows that universal healthcare is not the quick fix. It's not the total fix. It's a first step towards increasing a community's health, but it isn't a magical solution. And of course, we haven't got to this point yet, but I want to tell you that access to healthcare for all the European countries and research is about 10% of what is causing the huge disparities in health in our communities. The life expectancy in this study in the neighborhoods that were in poverty compared to the uh, wealthier neighborhoods of Hamburg uh, was 13 years. So I'm telling you 13 years gone if you are from that neighborhood in poverty that you will not live just based on the stress of being in poverty or the stress of being marginalized or the stress of racism. This is the kind of inequities that persist throughout the lower income residents and the, in this case, in, in Germany, they never skip, uh, they'll never skip medication or the doctor's visits because they don't have access to them. So what is, you know, what is, what should we do about this? But first we have to look at how, what are the elements? And if you look at this, you have four races here and you have three um, populations of uh, income. So repeatedly, the health research shows biggest problem is chronic stress and the kind of st stress stress that we experience from like being within a population is considered less than or we feel like the population of the dominant culture feels like we're less than and so this is the stress of like that constant day-to-day -day stress of somebody maybe coming up to you in big lots right and you're shopping in big lots and somebody asks you where's the soap where's the hand soap and you're also a customer and so that kind of difference, those little moments add up and it creates a lot of stress and blood pressure goes up in people in populations that have that kind of stress and that it doesn't come down. It's not like, okay, I'm stressed out. My, my um, numbers are going higher, right? And then after I calm down, my blood pressure goes down. No, it just stays up after a while. So this national inter health interview survey uh, is randomly administrated along with the census every 10 years. So we haven't got our new census, right, finished. So this is from 2010. So I'll, I'll get the update when we get the new one. And what we have here is, let's talk about what those, what the colors are. The blue bars represent the federal poverty line. The red bar is 200% of the federal poverty line. So like twice as much and up. So that includes everyone who probably has sustainable resources and up. And the yellow line is those people that you and I meet uh, who uh, help us at the counter at the convenience store. The working poor who are usually uh, pretty uh, underinsured in the United States. So the data shows multiple layers of chronic stress within each race and ethnicity. So as you can see, poverty, this is my point, 
poverty intersects with each one of those populations. So within each one of those populations, there's an intersection of economic class. And economic class poverty is unrelenting in creating even more stress and even more health disparities. So the wealthier you are, the healthier you are, even within your race or ethnicity. So these are the social determinants of health, and they're powerful, as they call them, non-medical factors that influence health. And I particularly wanted to, to show you these. But these stem from years of population health research and are usually the focus of public health professionals in your community. So that is really good to know, especially if you've got a Bridges community or if you're beginning a Bridges community, because most of you know that Bridges out of poverty at the community level and maybe at the policy level, and even at the institutional level is gonna impact every one of these non-medical factors that's creating health disparities. Uh, so to improve employment and income, housing, transportation, childcare, education, discrimination, and the quality of the places that people live, work, and learn, and play, that has a positive impact on health. So it's very important for me to tell you that because I think that sometimes as we're working in our communities, we forget to mention that one of the biggest goals that we have in creating stable lives is also to create better health as develop better health. Um, sorry, gone the wrong way. So uh, the other thing we're looking at is what happens within healthcare, within those systems and how our patients who are more at risk or marginalized, um, how are those patients being engaged? And so that engagement is very interesting. Uh, Susie Johnson uh, gave us this slide. It was, uh, I think it was Susie, but we've got two circles, right? And the flow of information going both ways between the patient and the caregiver is equal. But then sometimes you've got that big circle talking at you and you're the little circle. Have you ever felt like that? If somebody's just kind of telling you what to do and why you need to do it, and I think this happens in all our sectors. And one of the reasons it happens is because we don't have much time with our patients and we don't have much time with our clients. And so we try to get a lot done, but you can't skip this step. So one of the goals of this work is to help help systems have a positive impact on really high risk populations, especially those patients in poverty with difficult non-medical factors such as unemployment, housing, and so forth. So it lets us to see it lets us see that we can't feel discounted when we're with our doctor, especially um, because it has to be an even flow of relationship. So we'll talk about that a little bit more. So of course, here are the inequities that that uh, we are looking at improving um, and moving always towards policy and procedural change and improving neighborhood conditions. And this is what Bridges is about. And Bridges to Health is also a part of that. And then the, the other piece is to look at how we look at those marginalized populations and we create voice and power. I mean, Bridges has been a power balancer in my, in my view for 20 years because it brings people to the decision-making table or it brings people to that decision-making table within an institution on how do we design services that would never have had voice before. It's all about sharing power. And it's one of the very few places where we can see that. So we're looking at that engagement and rapport. It's very important. So I had the honor of uh, co-authoring this article for the American Journal of Nurse Practitioners with Barbara Wise, who's been a uh, nurse practitioner for, for many years and using the Bridges work, Bridges to Health and Healthcare. And um, just wanted to show you that. And it's in your links, by the way, if you'd like to read that. And she and I had a great time talking about those personal engagements of patients who are at risk. First, I need to tell you that 20% of the patients in any health system are using 80% of that health system's resources. So the health system is really struggling, right? And so they're trying to, you know, make sure that everybody has equity, everybody has great health, but how do we do that? Um, well, one of the ways that we do it is that we don't just talk at people. And she allows that 20 minutes that you're not supposed to allow. You're supposed to get 10 minutes with your patient. But she said a patient will come in and has not had their script renewed and didn't come and miss their last appointment. And she's like, well, what's going on? And then this 10 minutes, 10 minutes of, you know, this 
not get to the point, but 10 minutes of, you know, well, my daughter got expelled from school. And the next thing I thought of, my 13 year old had gotten someone pregnant. And then my other son got sent up and then my dad went into the hospital and all this was happening at once. And so while the story is going on, it usually takes 10 minutes. And Barbara said she sees what's happening. If, if a healthcare provider just looks at their watch during that 10 minutes, they've broken relationship. And what we began to realize is when someone who's resourced and believes in this big red arrow and knows how to give you the information beginning, middle and end in two minutes comes in as a provider, you you hit the mother load because right now you've got somebody who's all about, OK, I'm looking at you. You're the physician. You're the expert. I've already Googled you. I know our relationship is about the achievement. If, if the patient comes from the achievement world, but if the patient comes from a relationship world, which may be a world of, of their ethnicity or of poverty, perhaps, you're going to have to take the time to build the trust because your achievement is not going to build the trust. So this is a great mental model that we can share with your healthcare providers to show how abstract treatment planning is. And the big complaint is patients in poverty are non-compliant. One of the reasons is we don't really understand when we're a patient of poverty, all the abstract pieces. And so to draw a model is priceless. And many times the patient will want to take that model with them. And so, you know, that's great. The last thing I want to talk to you, this article is also in um, the uh, links, but this piece is huge. And that is Advantage Dental, 250 dentists. And they began to use Bridges to Health and Healthcare and they made huge and significant changes. And one of the things they realized was they couldn't change poverty, but they could change their system. So they looked at the hidden rules of oral health from the perspective of folks in poverty. And what they find out, it ain't a problem till it's a problem. People would come in, their heads blowing up with pain, and they'd be a walk-in and they'd have to turn them away. But now, after looking at bridges, they went ahead to the expense of uh, providing a third chair, which they call the urgent chair. I mean, that's a big change, 250 dentists. So what they did, oh, my, my bell's ringing, so I have to stop. So what they did de decreased the, the reason that people were going uh, to the emergency department, which is costing a lot of money, uh, was oral health. They would decrease that from number one to number 10. So it is possible. So I have a little bit more to share with you that you will see uh, on that last slide. But I, what I want you to do is take care of yourself and, and use all the resources that you can to do that uh, during these, these times. If you want to know more about Bridges, it's, it's on hahaprocess.com, Bridges to Health, and let me know. I thank you so much. I'm, I'm out of here, Jim. Ah, we love you, Terry. That was amazing stuff. The problem with thank all you. of this material is there's too much to share. <laughs> in the moment that we have there's always wow. more but please get in touch with terry she's got lots to share about this and she can encourage you in your work in healthcare. your healthcare system is going to be stressed there's no way around they're already stressed they're doing amazing work but the, the bridges work can really help with that well we are going to move on to something really exciting and just as we go on right now you're going to start seeing some other faces pop on and we're gonna do something called sharing your aha moment. So if the uh, other presenters can come on that are gonna be doing that, this is something that you yourself can uh, actually participate in. And in your uh, question box, you'll see a link where you can actually share your aha moment as we begin to collect how the bridges work, the framework, all of it has changed people's lives and not only personally, individually, but also within our institutions, within our whole communities. So we're gonna hear from eight people who are going to share in 20 seconds, or we cut you off, your uh, aha moment. And Ben, would you like to start for us? Just whenever Absolutely. you start, the clock starts. You got 20 Absolutely. seconds, buddy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Terry. That was wonderful information. Uh, 11 years ago, I heard Dr. Ruby Payne speak on a framework for understanding poverty. The understanding that I gained that day helped me frame the challenges that I had experienced growing up in poverty and as a first generation college student. I sincerely believe that when this work is applied, uh, uh, it, it can be and has been for me transformative. Thank you. All right, let's move on to Ryan. Thank you. 
One of my many aha moments was one that came recently. COVID taught us that we are all connected. It's clear our health is connected to each other. And if one person is not well in our community, it impacts all of us. My aha moment is that this is exactly what Bridges teaches us. Mm. It's about all of us together, understanding and caring for one another to make our community stronger. Thank you. Stunning, Ryan. Thank you so much. Laura. Yes, my aha moment was when my facilitator, Carolyn Lewis, made the comment that discipline is way more than just learning. It's more about learning through the punishment. Wow, that's that's great stuff. Michelle. Good morning. Good morning, Michelle. <laughs> Hi, my aha moment occurred in 2013 after reading Understanding the Framework of Poverty given to me by a friend. Uh, this book actually served as a catalyst for me becoming a facilitator, as well as being a major role um, uh, stakeholder in the city of Saginaw to create a Bridges community. Awesome. Michelle, I, I grew up in Midland. We should connect sometime. All right, Bonnie, yes. you're right. Good morning. Um, you know, in my many years of doing community work, I had always felt like economic class was the elephant in the room and we just didn't have language for it. So Bridges gave us the concept and the language to do that interrogation. But the real game changer was getting ahead because now we could do it in the relationships with people who are experiencing poverty with the goal of reducing poverty and economic justice. And that's the missing piece in most communities. Beautiful stuff. Carla. Oh, Mike, I skipped you. Sorry. Go, Mike. Good morning. My aha moment was in 2002 when I attended a framework uh, workshop uh, being conducted by Ruby Payne in Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, when she started talking about resources, talking about uh, support systems, hidden rules, language, at uh, mental resources and relationships, it helped me to connect the dots to see how I was able to uh, escape from the situational poverty I was growing up in. Now I'm able to share this information with others to help them to create a bridge to experience the same thing. All right, Mike and Carla, now it's your turn. Sorry about that. Hey, hi there. Greetings from Indianapolis. My life forever changed about 20 years ago when I first encountered a framework for understanding poverty, like many others. Uh, the hidden rules of economic class made the biggest impact on me. I understood myself, my family, better than ever and i was able to transfer that into my professional life and uh become a better school leader and make a more of an impact on my students and their families great stuff reuben we're actually ahead of the game you have three extra seconds go <laughs> prior to my involvement with the hot process every school i worked with discussed economically disadvantaged students with either pity or judgment mm -hmm. and i fell into the trap of the same when I took the workshop, what I realized is that my students were much more bulletproof, aware, and prepared for life than I thought, and I no longer see them as broken. Also, I was working with uh, diversity issues at the time, and when I added the economic diversity layer to all the cultural and racial stuff, what I realized is that the conversations became more specified and easier to work towards resolve because they were much more understandable. The two often get confused for each other. Beautiful. Hey, that is just, that is some great stuff. Look, can you imagine having a link that you could go to on the AHA Process website where you could just keep watching these? Wouldn't you like to hear from everybody's AHA moment and just hear over and over and over again? In your, in your question box, you can see there's a place where you can do that. Go ahead and send your AHA moment to that uh, website or that, that address right there. And uh, maybe we can, uh, we can uh, accumulate some and have a link like that. Hey, friends, that was amazing. Thank you very much. It's just inspirational to know that there's so many people out there with these kinds of stories where lives individually, institutionally, community are being changed. Ricky. Thank you, Jim. And thank you for all those wonderful, quick, succinct moments, too. And so this is what it's about. I mean, seeing each other and recognizing that there is always ways we can expand and grow further. Uh, in, on our, uh, in our understanding of how we can better serve our clients and not see people as broken, but see people as the solution to what needs to heal the community. Um, so let's tra transition right over.
to Norma Lahia, I think I said that correct on the last name, um, with nurturing students' resilience by addressing emotions. Norma, it's off to you. Good morning. My name is Norma Vigela. You almost got it right. Um, it is an honor to be here this morning. Greetings from California. I am currently a school principal at an alternative education high school. I work with students that are amazing individuals, but are constantly navigating through various obstacles. I have been working at this school for five years now, and for the past two years, my team has been working with addressing emotional poverty at our campus. As educators, we have learned that when we provide emotional resources for our students, the discipline referrals um, are eliminated or are lessened, and also school violence is less prevalent at our school site. Students feel that they're cared for, and also there is a better relationship between educators and students. We all know that children are hurting. Um, you know, the issue of trauma, we've been talking about trauma, and the issue of trauma is not new to our school sites. Um, I want to tell you a story about one of my students, Tanisha. Tanisha is a 16 year old. Norma? Yes. Norma? Yes. We've lost your PowerPoint. Goodness. Thank you. Can you see it? Yes, thank you. Great, thank you. The, the issue of trauma is not new to our schools. So I want to tell you about one of my students, Tanisha. Tanisha is a 16 year old, beautiful, beautiful individual. She carries a lot of emotions, but what we generally see at our school site is anger. She comes in angry and sometimes leaves angry from our school site. One day she arrived late to school and you know, we just allowed her to go into her school, into her classroom. She was late. She proceeded to sit down in the classroom. Within a few minutes, she began a verbal altercation with another student. What we were able to do is separate the other student from her and allow her to calm down. Um, Tanisha that day decided that she was not going to move from her seat. She just sat in the classroom and continued to, uh, you know, yell out things and just make everybody uncomfortable in the classroom. So when the administrator arrived, um, the administrator had to make a very quick decision. And he had two options. The first option was to call security and have Tanisha removed forcefully. Or the second option was to allow Tanisha to calm down, give her a few minutes, and then be able to move Tanisha from that classroom into another space. So he opted for the most human, uh, just the, for the most human possibility. Um, he allowed Tanisha to calm down for a few minutes while he was still there and security was waiting outside. But then within a few minutes, we asked Tanisha to move to another classroom and we gave Tanisha what she needed at that moment. We gave her some water and we gave her time and a space so that she can calm herself down. Within, you know, when, when she was ready to talk to us, she disclosed that that morning she had been in a fight with her mother. Upon waking up, she had gone in a fight with her mom, and on her way to school, she had been jumped by three other three other individuals. So once Tanisha opened up to us, we were able to see that her emotional meltdown had nothing to do with the school site. So, but what we can see is that our students, our, our young people, are dealing with a lot of toxic and overwhelming experiences that sometimes result in a lot of things that are expressed in the classroom. But these difficulties many times have nothing to do with what's happening on in the classroom. But we know that they're dealing with a lot of fam family violence and also with a lot of neighborhood violence. And that sometimes is carried on, that emotional noise carries on into our classrooms. Several factors may predict whether or not students will disengage from school or earn a high school diploma. It is estimated that approximately 46% of all youth has at least one risk factor and 18% have two or more risk factors. There are four main factors that contribute to disengagement. The first one being their background, the second one being their educational performance, the third one, their attitudes, and the fourth, their behaviors. Through a deeper understanding of emotional poverty, we have been able to address two of these factors, which are behaviors and attitudes. 
Student disengagement is exhibited in, in the way that our students are behaving. Addressing emotional poverty is crucial in preventing students from giving up from their right to be educated. Increasingly, what we're seeing in schools is that our educators are dealing with a lot more um, emotional issues, outbursts, violence, rage, anger, avoidance, and anxiety. The current methods of discipline are just not working for our students. What we have been able to do with Tanisha is provide additional resources and also mentorship opportunities so that she can navigate her emotions. We have addressed her behavior, but most importantly, we're getting to know her now. She is resilient and she is very interested in graduating high school. At our school, we're, we're working hard to meet the needs of the whole students. So at our school, our model is built on a framework that focuses on four tenets. The first one is caring, the second one, academic growth, the third one, mentorship, and the fourth one, resilience. We believe that as educators, we could do a lot to either shape their behavior to be positive or, or shape their behavior to be negative. So what we're focusing is on that care before we do any of the other things, we have to care for our students. As I mentioned, we have been working with the text Emotional Poverty in All Demographics for the last two years. Through our work with emotional poverty, we have been able to understand what happens when our student's brain is not regulated or not integrated. We also understand that sometimes our students are arriving to school with their inner self underdeveloped. The external environment also repeatedly reinforces our, feel, our students feeling less than or separate from. We also know that we can create an environment where our students' emotional emotion, emotions are uh, validated so that they can perform better in other areas. Most importantly, because now we're open to learning about emotional poverty, we can now motivate good behavior and work together towards motivating the good behavior of our students that are at most at risk. All emotions are, are set, are rooted on safety and belonging. So what we are all doing together is ensuring that we provide an environment where our students feel that they're safe, but also that they belong to the framework of the school system. We refuse to give up on our students. We refuse to give up. And this approach has allowed us to focus on the behavior and not the person. Also, this approach does not see difficult students are ba as bad or sick, but rather as injured. This information looks at how to approach a student so that both the individual and also the campus can function at a higher level of safety and belonging. Emotional poverty has given us a common language to explore the concepts and also the understanding. Also, it has given us tools and strategies to motivate good behavior. There is a different path to success, you know, and every student has a different path to their own success. We can support our students by shaping their path. I've got another student, one of my dear students, Cynthia. Cynthia graduated this year. Cynthia, when she came to us two years ago, was not very interested in attending school. She had been sent to us because her probation officer had, had outlined that she needed to go to school and also that she needed to be working on getting a high school diploma. We already knew that Cynthia had, had some issues interacting with other people in a classroom, so we decided that when Cynthia was not doing well, we provided a space next to the administrator's office so that she can work and just have, have some moments so that she can, have a, she can be ready to go back to class. One day, Cynthia was working there in the study room by herself when another student came in. We allowed another student to go into the, into the room to, get, to grab a book. Within a few minutes, a verbal altercation began, and then it became a physical fight. Once we, did, once we were able to separate the two students, we proceeded to investigate. It turned out that both of the students had nothing in common. All they wanted to do was get in a fight so that they both could be expelled. On this day, we decided to go the emotional poverty route. So we helped our, st our students. We separated the students and provided some adults that could help them feel loved or lovable equal to. We allowed opportunities for them to know that they belong to our school system and also that they are capable of graduating and worthy of a high school diploma. The compassion that we gave our students totally transformed their behavior. From then on, we had no 
uh, further altercations between the two students or with any other student. Also, uh, we've been able to see our students do better academically. Cynthia graduated, the other, the other girl transferred to another school and now she's doing well. It is very important to understand through emotional poverty that sometimes our kids are gonna need a second chance, sometimes a third chance, sometimes more, even more chances so that they can feel that compassion from the education system. The resilience through understanding emotional poverty. So now we know that when our student act out, it stems from stressors that have nothing to do with the school. Also our response, look at the student's bad behavior with the purpose of motivating good behavior rather than punishing the students for their emotional hits that have caused that behavior. Our educators seek to create a caring environment where we can eliminate the risks that are causing other emotional hits to emerge. We understand that educators also can come with some emotional noise. So we're training also our educators on how to calm themselves down before they interact with a student that may be in an emotional hit. We talk about a lot about resilience, but only through understanding our students, you know, un only through understanding their emotion is that we are able to dive into their resilience. There is the resilience of our students. We've seen it before COVID that they had a lot of emotional hits. They, there was a lot of emotional noise. Now, as we're living through this COVID time and after we come back, we're gonna be dealing with a lot more, not only financial poverty, but also that emotional poverty. So I think emotional poverty is giving us those tools that we need so that when our students come back on campus, we can work and have a more compassionate environment where we can understand what they're going through, but also understand that a lot of them have a lot of emotional hits and a, a lot of emotional noise that sometimes has nothing to do with the school system. Emotional poverty, what it looks in practice is we now know and we now work towards understanding how much care matters. The relationships between positive adults and students can increase and has increased our attendance, our participation, our retention, and our graduation rates. Given the research findings, we know that it is possible to develop emotional competence and strengthen our student uh, and strengthen our students. We can teach about the regulated and integrated brain and how to get our students to calm down. We could also work towards building a stronger inner self and we can create classrooms and campuses that promote our students feeling valid, validated and preventing them from feeling less than or separate from. Also, we, we know in a lot of the work that we've been doing, um, we now understand that adults totally make a difference. The emotional well-being of adults totally make a difference. <clears throat> and it is important to support our educators to address their own emotional stability. So we're working on self practices that address our, our, our educators because we know that our educators are going through secondary traumatic stress and also educators have a lot of compassion fatigue. So we're working on how do we stabilize our educators so that there's better interaction between educators and students. The third thing is we know that all students can achieve and this, this Ruby Payne writes, every child should have an equal opportunity to develop talents to live, to learn and to love. What we're seeing is that our students, if they feel loved and cared for, there's less discipline referrals and also there's increased student achievement, and also our teachers feel more satisfied about the work that they're doing. To end, I want to say that teaching is hard work, but it's more than anything is hard work. It has to do with your heart. There's another, um, at the end of Emotional Poverty One, Ruby Payne writes that education has always been and will always be a human endeavor, a social interaction. By paying more attention to the emotional, by paying more attention to the emotional well-being of our students and ourselves, we ensure that education um, feels safe and not dangerous. Um, and addressing emotional poverty has allowed us to remain hopeful and also proximate to our students. Emotional poverty allows us to see our students through a more human lens. I want to thank you for 
everything, all of the work in this space. I want to thank you for listening and I want to thank you for all the care and love and compassion that you continue to demonstrate our students. Thank you. Thank you, Norma. And thank you for reminding us that we need to be mindful about what we bring in emotionally and also ways to be mindful about how we can tap into the emotions and validate and affirm students in times of uh, trauma, especially with the students and the class that they're going through right now. This is something that truly no generation before them has experienced uh, this level of education and distancing through virtual communications as well. So thank you for reflecting and having us reflect on ways that we need to be in tune with ourselves so we can be in tune with our students. So thank you very much, Norma. Um, as we transition on to our next pre uh, presenters, uh, this is another Petra Kucha style production. And I like to thank and welcome in Eddie Polanco and June Roman, who's going to talk about staying ahead. Eddie and June, you have it. Hi, I'm Eddie Polanco. And I'm June Roman. Today we want to talk about staying ahead by looking at how, how City Mission of Schenectady is helping our city, how getting ahead changed my life, and how Schenectady is utilizing the program to help people stay ahead. The city of Schenectady has a population of more than 66,000 people. Schenectady has placed a high priority on workforce development programs and resource navigation to not only make sure no one gets left behind, but that people can get ahead and stay ahead. Schenectady has a poverty rate of almost 20%, which means that more than 13,000 people are lacking essential resources every day. As the faith-based organization, City Mission utilizes bridges constructs by integrating, getting ahead into our discipleship and recovery programs. City Mission has a focus on staying ahead by transforming lives. Between our transitional housing, on-the-job coaching, and our downtown ambassador program, our goal is to equip individuals to get ahead and stay ahead. I was raised in the Bronx in a single parent home with two younger siblings and no father figure. This plus physical, mental, and emotional abuse all led me to the streets by the age of 15, where I became addicted to heroin, numb to emotions, and stealing from drug dealers. Shortly after I started down that road, my mother decided it was best for us to move up to Schenectady. There, I had my first child at 17, was expelled from school and heroin controlled my life. By my early 20s, I had three young, uh, three children who I neglected. This was the beginning of a cycle that I never imagined getting out of. Because of my addiction, I overdosed twice, I was in and out of rehab centers and jail and found myself homeless. I had given up and accepted that I'd always be a junkie and nothing more. In 2012, I was given one more chance to change my life. I was accepted into the drug court program and introduced to the city mission. There, I was referred to a group called Getting Ahead in a Just Getting By World. It was like no other group I've ever attended. The skills and tools I learned were life-changing. Our group facilitator, Chris Parsons, who I still refer to as mom, genuinely cared about me. I found her feedback, look forward to our conversations. I felt that motherly love I've never known before. Our relationship became one of my biggest aha moments. All my life, I used people, used anyone and everyone to survive day to day. And I burnt a lot of bridges. But I wanted to show Chris respect as I valued her as a leader, resource, and as a son should value his mother. This aha moment allowed me to see the difference between using and utilizing resources. I was so impacted by the my time in getting ahead that when I was recognized as someone that would be a good facilitator. In my role, I try to lead by example so that participants can come to their own aha moment. Chris taught me that they won't be able to stay ahead if I'm telling them what to do. They need to own their own aha moment. Today, I'm focused on staying ahead and breaking cycles, being the father, the husband, and the man I've always wanted to be. 
I've learned to utilize my lived experiences from poverty and addiction to help others. Schenectady has placed a high priority on workforce development programs and resource navigation and make sure that no one gets left behind and that people can get ahead and stay ahead. We're currently using the Getting Ahead program at seven different Schenectady locations. Schenectady has hosted around 40 graduations, resulting in approximately 520 graduates since 2012. We strive to help each individual realize their full potential and teach them how to utilize resources so that they can continue to grow as they write their future story. I have already made strides in my recovery through other programs, but getting ahead allowed me to discover that I was a prisoner of my own block mentality. I worked through this with my group and realized that even though I grew up in the lower class, if I utilized my new resources and connections, the middle class was attainable for me. Graduating from the Getting Ahead program was nerve wracking. As a participant, I learned a great deal and had to trust myself and the Lord to put it all into action. The exciting part was that when I graduated, I left more prepared for the challenges ahead than when I first started. As a result, I was equipped to launch my future story. Participants stay connected by working the 11 resources and maintaining the relationships they built. They no longer use the system, but have learned to utilize it in order to stay ahead. Staying connected has been the greatest tool that most of our graduates utilize as they work to stay ahead. While co-facilitating in the jail, I found the reason that participants had successfully completed getting ahead and transitioned back into society is because they were able to accomplish a lot of their SMART goals. Additionally, the Schenectady community offers returning citizens resources to help them on their journey. Today, I'm a Getting Ahead facilitator and a certified Bridges Out of Poverty trainer. Through my own journey, navigating through resources and living out all I've learned from getting ahead, I continue to work hard on staying ahead. I do this through leading by example and being a resource to others. We pray that everyone who goes through the Getting Ahead program leaves with their aha moment and paradigm shift so that in Getting Ahead, they can stay ahead. We want to thank the Getting Ahead program for the lives that are being changed because of it, for the opportunity to be a part of something big. <laughs> thank you, guys. Yeah. Thank you both, Man. too. Eddie Andrew, that was wonderful. And I think it's a wonderful capstone to what we were learning today, which is failure is not the end. Quitting is. Don't quit on your students. Don't quit on yourself. Realize and help them have validation and hope. That's what this whole conference is about, is to re-inspire us not to quit, to let our students know not to quit. Don't be conditioned by failure right but be propelled to go forward towards success everybody has a storm but you just keep going through it and have hope and have resources and i love that quote don't use utilize the resources around you right mm -hmm. have that be expiring so thank you so much eddie and june uh for that wonderful capstone to these presentations in uh this morning uh jim your thoughts uh Stani, you guys are heroes man that was incredible good deal um, hey, you know, we got the workshops coming up in 10 minutes, uh, so yep. make sure you uh, get a little quick little break, but it's a quick turnaround before we get into our workshops. Still more good stuff to come. If, if you haven't noticed in the chat, all of these sessions will be available at the AHA Process website after they're recorded and loaded. So if you've seen something today that you want to remember and go back to, it's going to be available to you. And then don't forget that tonight we have the uh, share your story, tell your story, your experience uh, opportunity. Uh, this is always a great event when we're live. I think it'll be just as exciting uh, when we're watching it on online. So yeah, I'm I'm really excited for the rest of the day. All right, well, Jim, I think we're gonna let these people go to the breakout sessions. Make sure you remember you have to register for the breakout session to get access to it. So if you haven't done that, take these next 10 minutes to do that. Go ahead and do a one function uh, a bathroom break or a break or whatever they need to get your energy ready for these next sessions. And I think myself and Jim, thank you all for uh, tuning in and listening to this opening session all over the world, all over the nation. And we will see you all 
uh, tomorrow morning as well. So take care and enjoy your breakout sessions for the rest of this afternoon. All right, bless you guys. We'll see you.